Okay, uh, so hi, I'm Rick Passaro. Um, I'm an Android developer at Milwaukee Tool, and I'm here to talk about fakes, mocks, and spies, oh my. As soon as my clicker wakes up. Okay, so um, this isn't exactly a, a testing talk, but it's a, it's, it's a talk about how to execute your tests, how to, how to structure your tests, and uh, so we've got to talk about tests first. Uh, like what our objectives are. And I would say that tests, um, they should break when your app breaks, when the functionality that you're trying to achieve within the application, not within a class, breaks. Uh, it's behavior, not implementation. Um, but similarly, they should pass when your app is working. You shouldn't have flaky tests. Uh, if you have flaky tests, then uh, when you get failures, you're going to uh, you're going to doubt them, you're going to be unsure whether you should actually treat them, and uh, it's, uh, it's going to slow down your process considerably if you're using CI and waiting for everything to pass before you can merge. Um, then your tests should be easy to read. Uh, just like with your normal code, you're, um, when you're in the moment and you're, you're composing uh, you know, this awesome function, you're going to have a really good concept, hopefully, of what it is that you're doing, but six months from now, when that's broken, um, are you or someone else going to be able to look at this code and uh, skim it and, and figure out what's going on? Or are you going to need to put your head down and put some time into it before you can figure it out? Let's make everything, even in our testing, as, uh, as explicit and clear and terse as possible. And then finally, um, your tests should be really fast to write. Um, there's... Uh, Actually, just last week at KotlinConf, we had a lot of conversations about the time investment of writing tests and, uh, and the, the cost that's associated with something that is almost always just going to say, okay, everything is good, move on. So when you're writing your tests, um, possibly uh, against your boss's wishes, uh, you know, they want you to go work on the next feature, um, you really need to be able to execute what you need to do as quickly as possible. So let's focus on these last two. Um, anybody, at least who's an Android developer, has seen a test like this before. This is auto-generated when you create a new project. And uh, we're, we're just taking you know, our result and um, using JUnit assertions to, uh, to you know, assert equality with this for. And I hate this function. Um, assert equals is... Uh, it's a relic of Java, and Java makes me angry. Uh, it's, uh, it's not, it doesn't read well. It's, uh, the order is weird. Um, and let me show you what I mean. So let's break this test. Let's say 2 plus 3 is now equal to 4. And if we run it, in the GUI, we would get this nice, uh, nice message that says, well, we expected 4, but we actually got 5. This is more expressive than what we're actually seeing in our code. And what's more, um, if we switch these order, the order of these arguments so that result is first, I think this actually probably reads better. Um, I would expect the, the first argument to, to be the one which is the, uh, uh, the value that we're trying to assert against, but it's not. And if we run this, we're going to get this really confusing message which says that we expected five and we got four. And of course, we know that that's incorrect. And this is simple, and we can, we can piece what happened together pretty quickly. But imagine, again, you're six months down the road after having written a comp uh, complicated test, and not only is the test failing, but you've got this, this one arcane expected thing and, and this other arcane actual thing, and you've got to figure out that not only is the test broken, but the thing that's running the test is, is also doing it incorrectly and telling you the wrong results. So there is something better, infix assertions. So instead of using these, uh, these postfix, Java, postfix Java relics, we can use uh, an infix extension function. And in this case, I'm using Kotlin tests should be. And uh, so this does the same thing. And if we run it, we'll see the same sort of error message, even though it's a different library. Uh, and there's more. So whereas with JUnit, we would have um, 
assert true, assert false, assert null, assert array equals. In, in Kotlin test, we have uh, the same operator which works on Booleans and it works on nullable types. We can compare it to a null or a non-null. Uh, we can uh, compare collections and we can even compare arrays because under the hood, Kotlin test will just take that array and do a two list for, for both of them and, and do the comparison there. Um, and uh, autocomplete still works. This is um, a common concern about infix functions uh, in DSLs, like, well, I'm gonna lose my, my dot, you know, give me the list of everything. And that's true, but if you structure your DSL well, um, you have other options. So in this case, everything which Kotlin test does starts with should. So as soon as you start typing should, you're still going to get that same autocomplete with all of your options. Not that you're going to need many of them, because should be works for pretty much everything. Uh, so we love Kotlin test at Milwaukee Tool. Um, it's really, it does way more than just better assertions. There's, uh, it's pretty much a clone of spec as well. It has lots of different um, BDD styles, Gherkin syntax, cucumber, whatever you'd like to call it, uh, given when then, and uh, does way, way more. But in terms of, of assertions, absolutely love it. Another option would be Cluent, um, which is just assertions. Um, don't pick and don't go back and forth between the two because with Cluent, the should be is actually called should equal and should be exists in Cluent and it's a, um, it's a referential equals. So if you're used to using Kotlin test and then you maybe spin up a test project and use Cluent and then go back to it after a couple of months, you're gonna have a really hard time figuring out why everything is failing. Not that that happened to me. So um, moving on, uh, talking about mocking now, let's say you have some new analytics solution that marketing decided they want and uh, uh, so you've got to add it to your app, and the last time it was updated was 2015. So it's in Java, but I converted it to Kotlin uh, for you because I'm super nice. Um, there are some problems with this analytics solution class. Uh, it's final by default because um, it's, well, in this case, it's, it's final by default, but it's Java, but it's a final class, and it has a private constructor, which was all the rage back then, and we have this static initialize function which uh, takes a, a, an Android context, which means you can't really do this on the JVM. And uh, we don't want this in, in uh, all of our classes, so we're gonna do the right thing, which is to make an interface, um, this analytics wrapper, and uh, we're going to inject this into wherever in our application we need to, uh, to do our reporting. So then, we would make an implementation of this, which takes that analytic solution as a constructor parameter. And uh, then it has this report function, which just delegates to, to that archaic library. Um, so now how do we test this? Um, in our test, first off, we're gonna use backticks because Kotlin, it's great. Um, our function names are now really nice and, and easy to read. And uh, we can use mock K, which is um, basically just a wrapper around Makito, but with a lot of really, really nice Kotlin syntax um, to generate a mocked object, even though it's a final class with a private constructor. We're just gonna use the magic of reflection and we still get it. Now we can uh, correct, we can create our subject as normal and uh, we can invoke the report and uh, that's going to work even though we haven't stubbed out any functionality for our mock because we have this relax, relaxed keyword um, in our analytic solution mock which says um, anything which is a unit, just return a unit. Anything which returns an int, return one, et cetera, et cetera. It gives uh, lazy uh, generic responses for everything. And now we can use verify uh, to say, okay, since we've called a uh, report on our subject, now our mock has had that corresponding call made to it, so we can verify that our delegation is working properly. So this is again mock K, uh, which is just at mock K.O.io. It's a wonderful library. Um, 
really, really love it, and I use it as little as possible because we're taking a picture. Okay, we're good. Um, let's look at this wrapper again. And uh, now let's say that our, uh, our analytic, our marketing team said, wait a second, you're sending all this garbage at us for your debug builds. This is screwing up our, uh, our picture of what our users are doing. Let's only have analytics running while we're, uh, while we're in, in release builds. So we add this app version dependency, which tells us whether we're in a debug build or not. And uh, we're only going to send stuff to analytics in a, in a release build. Um, otherwise, we can just still throw stuff at uh, the Android log. But how do we test Android log, right? This is um, a, a static class. It's super awkward. There's tons of stuff happening in it. If we, uh, if we, if we do a, um, a mock static on it and try to do a verify, we're going to get all kinds of garbage. We don't want to do that. But we have all been through middle school. So in middle school, we were told that uh, if you have some variable A, which equals B, and B equals C, then A equals C. This is called a transitive relation or a transitive property. And uh, we were refreshed on this when we took formal logic or discrete math or um, any of those classes. And we were told that if you have some A, which, uh, which then leads to B and B leads to C, then you can say that A leads to C. This is called chain rule most often. Otherwise, other names are transitive implication, hypothetical syllogism, double modus ponens. And uh, but we could maybe use this in our, uh, in our testing, right? So if we look at this, uh, this function uh, or this class again, we can split it apart so that um, if we're, if we're uh, in a debug, if we're not in a debug build, we can call this report to solution function. And if, we are, if we're in a debug build, we can just log it. And now we can see that if A, if we're in a, not, in, a, in a release build, we will call report to solution, which is B. And then if we call B, we should get C. So now if we test that, it seems like we can do this, this chain rule thing and verify that everything is working. So let's see how that would look. Uh, we're going to mock out our analytics solution again. We're going to mock out um, app version, and we're going to use an every to say that uh, every time we call app version.debug, we're going to return false, meaning we're in release build. And now we're going to add a spy k to our subject, which allows us to have that same sort of mock behavior for our subject uh, in regards to um, recording stuff, but it will, re recording calls for verifies, um, but it will still behave normally. So now we can call subject.report, and instead of checking solution, we can now do a verify on our subject and verify that this other function was called. So now to, to test this other class, uh, report to solution should delegate to analytic solution. Um, we're going to start out with the same dependencies, except now we don't need to use that every, since we're not calling app version for anything. And uh, now we, have, we can say every subject that perform complex task just runs. So this says this is a unit a function which returns a unit. Don't do anything. Don't create any side effects. Just move on. And now... Uh, at the end of this test, we can do two verifies. We can verify that perform complex task was done and that solution.report was done. So it seems like this is working just fine. We have uh, A verified to call B, and then we have a different test which says that B calls C, so we should be good. But now, what if uh, six months down the road, something happens and we decide to pull out this crappy SDK for the analytics solution. Um, now, A and B, the test for that is unchanged. But if we call this, if we run this test, the report to solution test, it's going to fail because we're no longer calling solution.report. In fact, it's probably not a Gradle dependency anymore, and this wouldn't even build. But we get the idea. So what we're going to do 
is uh, you know in our PB as part of our our task to uh, pull out this analytic solution, we're going to remove that line. And as soon as we remove that line, now everything is going to build again. Oh, we're done. Move on. This test is unchanged, the first one. So because of this, I would say that verify is usually a code smell, and you should use it as a last resort. Um, the thing about uh, chain rule is that you are saying, if it is true that A leads to B and B leads to C, then A leads to B. But in our testing, we are saying A leads to B, and then in a different statement entirely, we are saying B leads to C. There's no actual continuity between them. So verify, don't use it. Instead, let's say that uh, now you've got some presenter, which is the one that's actually invoking this, this wrapper, and it's got some function on important button click. And when you click that important button, you want to tell the analytics about it. So how would you test this? Uh, using mock K, you would, you would do the same thing. You would, uh, you would mock out your analytics wrapper. You would create a new subject with that mocked version. Then you can call important button click and you can verify uh, that everything happened. But remember that when we were setting up this wrapper, we made it in an interface. So we have another option in regards to uh, supplying this, uh, this wrapper. We can make a fake analytics wrapper, uh, which implements that interface. And um, then we can add a, a history, which is a test only uh, implementation detail of this fake and uh, whenever we call report we can just add it to this history and then we can add a uh, reset function for you know reuse in different tests so that everything stays nice and hermetic so now in our test instead of creating a mock we can make the fake and uh, then perform the same same logic but then uh, analytics dot, analytics wrapper dot history should be uh, you know, some list. So instead of using verifies, we're able to check that uh, uh, the, like everything which has been called is represented in this list. And this isn't actually the best example of, of where a fake uh, comes in play. So instead, let's say that we have some, uh, some interface for a DAO for events. Now events aren't a string, they're a big complex thing. And uh, we can make a fake version of this DAO, which is backed by a mutable map and uh, has the key of this ID string, just like it would in a database. Now these, uh, the functions of get all, get by ID and insert, we can create Java implementations of those which mirror what would be done in SQLite. So now, if we were to, if we were to run a test which requires a DAO, instead of running say RoboElectric and making an in-memory uh, database with room and, and having all these expensive operations or using mock which requires a lot of setup and a lot of boilerplate to stub out all of our functionality, we can instead just use a fake which has all the operations already pre-built and is ready to go wherever we want to use them. And fakes don't just apply to uh, to, to interfaces for complex classes. They work for data classes as well. Uh, so this is our event class that we were talking about. And um, if you have a, a large app uh, that's based around these analytics, you're going to have lots of events that you need to create in lots of places. So let's go ahead and create an object with a, uh, a static create function, which takes uh, all of the parameters which are inside this event, but has defaults for all of them. So we can, this will allow us to very quickly create um, an event with default data, except for whatever we would like, similar to a copy, but with a lot less boilerplate at the call site. And then we can define the default values as constants at the bottom for convenience as well. So that's the end of my talk. Um, here are my slides, uh, links for Kotlin test, Fluent, and Mach-K. Uh, the slides don't actually Slides link doesn't go anywhere because it, it seems like speaker deck is uh, having some technical difficulties right now. So uh, I promise I'll get those uploaded as soon as I can. Um, there's my Twitter on the bottom. I will tweet a link to my slides um, as, uh, as soon as they're working. 
And thank you very much. Yes. Is there a danger in creating a fake uh, representation given that you're writing a new set of logic potentially to influence what comes out in your test versus what the real uh, so there's something called a verified fake, um, which, uh, so theoretically, you, so you've got a DAO, uh, a real DAO, and uh, if you have anything other than basic CRUD operations for it, then, um, or maybe even with basic CRUD operations, you would have unit tests to, uh, to make sure that all of your queries are actually working. Right, so you're not checking your SQL. You're not checking that SQLite does its job or that Room does its job. You're checking that your queries are not garbage. So you have unit tests for your real implementation, and um, you can simply run those same unit tests against a fake DAO and verify that they all work. Um, in some cases, in many cases, your DAO, your fakes are going to be so trivial that you feel like that's not necessary, not really necessary. Um, but uh, that's that's an option that that some people use. You can also um, uh, leverage um, like base test classes or custom test runners to do that automatically. Write a you know write a DAO, DAO test which uh, takes a parameter of like a lambda for both types of of DAOs. Your room version. Sorry, I'm being opinionated. Not necessarily room. Whatever your DAO is. Uh, so uh, you know, you could have something which takes two different constructors for your two DAO types and then automatically uh, verifies everything. Uh, that's what I would do. Yes. So if you're building a mock by hand, I'm sorry, building a fake, are you essentially building a mock by hand? Like things that mock A are just doing even like one line and build out an entire fake for so it totally depends, right? There are there are definitely cases where a mock makes sense. Um, mocks are not a code smell. Uh, in my opinion, but if you're if you find that you're utilizing you're using the same class over and over and over again, and um, you're writing the same like mock setup, um, then uh, it makes sense to just put it in one place. As well as uh, it depends on how you're using your mocks, right? If you're um, if if you find that um, before you can actually utilize a mock, you have to Create a live data, and then say like every my mock dot live data returns this live data, and then afterwards you have to uh, you know do a couple of verifies and then check the live data. It's easier to just make a make a fake. Um, in that case, it would be easier with probably just one one use case, much less ten. Um, so that that would be the rationale. Just trade offs. Yeah. yeah. Any other question? Yes. Um, we've been currently using. Uh, Functions for creating your, like more complex data. It's really like hidden benefit of for creating fake data. So what I would love for um, uh, Kotlin 1.8, I guess, would be um, extension functions on uh, companion objects which don't exist yet. Right? Like, wouldn't it be nice if uh, you could just say like event dot create Something that would be ideal. Um, having a having a function totally works, and um, uh, I've seen a lot of people do that. But with the uh, with the object, you're basically just able to uh, hold all of those default values in a single place um, for convenience. And in our case, um, all of our data class dubber guys bakers uh, they all start with test. It's you know the actual data class with text uh, test um, prepended to it, so it's just very very easy to find what it is that you want. That's it. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Oh, just kidding. Yes. So I was just thinking, like, well, what's your take on the mock versus the mock is getting like abandoned? Uh, Yeah. 
Uh, <laughs> yep. So um, it, Alexi, the creator of Mach K, um, had a had a post a few weeks ago saying, "Hey guys, um, I have a small child. I'm backing off. Uh, I'm ba basically going to be doing ma maintenance. Um, I'm looking for someone to take over." Uh, sorry. So the the question is, given that. Um, what's my take on using Maquet instead of um, Maquito uh, going forward? Uh, I have not used Maquito in about a year and a half. I am not up to date whatsoever on what that API looks like. Um, I might just go ahead and try maintaining Maquet myself because it's it's so nice. The uh, the native uh, the the built-in coroutine support, the super nice syntax. Um, you don't have to add other additional artifacts in order to do final classes and objects and all that. It's uh, I'll I'll use it until I have to change. Okay, I think we're definitely over. Yep. Thank you so much.